Hello and welcome to Sleep Cove with me, Christopher Fitton. This week I've been invited to a Burns Night. It's a celebration of the Scottish poet Robert Burns, where people remember his poetry and also celebrate Scottish culture. With that in mind, I decided to read a couple of Scottish mythical tales out on the podcast. I really hope you'll enjoy them tonight. And let's begin. The Fairies of Merlin's Crag About two hundred years ago, there was a poor man working as a labourer on a farm in Lanarkshire. He was what is known as an aura man. That is, he had no special work mapped out for him to do. But he was expected to undertake odd jobs of any kind that happened to turn up. One day, his master sent him out to cast peats on a piece of moorland that lay on a certain part of the farm. Now this strip of moorland ran up at one end to a curiously shaped crag known as Merlin's Crag, because, so the country folk said, that famous enchanter had once taken up his abode there. The man obeyed, and being a winning fellow, when he arrived at the moor, he set to work with all his might and main. He had lifted quite a quantity of peat from near the crag when he was startled by the appearance of the smallest woman that he had ever seen in his life. She was only about two feet high, and she was dressed in a green gown and red stockings, and her long yellow hair was not bound by any ribbon, but hung loosely round her shoulders. She was such a dainty little creature that the astonished countryman stopped working, stuck his spade into the ground, and gazed at her in wonder. His wonder increased when she held up one of her tiny fingers, and addressed him in these words. What wilt thou think if I was to send my husband to uncover thy house? You mortals think that you can do aught that pleaseth you. Then, stamping her tiny foot, she added in a voice of command, Put back that turf instantly, or thou shalt rue this day. Now the poor man had often heard of the fairy folk, and of the harm that they could work to unthinking mortals who offended them. So in fear and trembling he set to work to undo all his labour, and to place every divot in the exact spot from which he had taken it. When he was finished, he looked round for his strange visitor, but she had vanished completely. He could not tell how, nor where. Putting up his spade, he wended his way homewards, and going straight to his master, he told him the whole story, and suggested that in future the peats should be taken from the other end of the moor. But the master only laughed, He was a strong, hearty man, and had no belief in ghosts or elves or fairies, or any other creature that he could not see. But although he laughed, he was vexed that his servant should believe in such things, so to cure him, as he thought of his superstition. He ordered him to take a horse and cart, and go back at once, and lift all the peats, and bring them to dry in the farm steading. 
The poor man obeyed with much reluctance, and was greatly relieved as weeks went on, to find that, in spite of his having done so, no harm befell him. In fact, he began to think that his master was right, and the whole thing must have been a dream. So matters went smoothly on. Winter passed, and spring and summer, until autumn came round once more, and the very day arrived on which the peace had been lifted the year before. That day, as the sun went down, the Aura man left the farm to go to his cottage, and as his master was pleased with him because he had been working very hard lately, he had given him a little can of milk as a present to carry home to his wife. So he was feeling very happy, and as he walked along he was humming a tune to himself. His road took him by the foot of Merlin's crag, and as he approached it he was astonished to find himself growing strangely tired. His eyelids dropped over his eyes as if he was going to sleep, and his feet grew as heavy as lead. I will sit down and take a rest for a few minutes, he said to himself. The road home never seemed so long as it does today. So he sat down on a tuft of grass right under the shadow of the crag, and before he knew where he was, he had fallen into a deep and heavy slumber. When he awoke, it was near midnight, and the moon had risen on the crag, and he rubbed his eyes, when by its soft light he became aware of a large band of fairies who were dancing round and round him, singing and laughing, pointing their tiny fingers at him, and shaking their wee fists in his face. The bewildered man rose and tried to walk away from them, but in turn, in whichever direction he would, the fairies accompanied him, encircling him in a magic ring, out of which he could in no wise go. At last they stopped, and with shrieks of elfin laughter, led the prettiest and daintiest of their companions up to him, and cried, Tread a measure, tread a measure, O man, then wilt thou not be so eager to escape from our company. Now the poor labourer was but a clumsy dancer, and he held back with a shame-faced air. But the fairy, who had been chosen to be his partner, reached up and seized his hands, and lo, some strange magic seemed to enter into his veins. For in a moment, he found himself waltzing and whirling, sliding and bowing, as if he had done nothing else but dance all his life. And the strangest thing of all, he forgot about his home and his children, and felt so happy that he no longer had the slightest desire to leave the fairy's company. All night long, the merriment went on. The little folk danced and danced as if they were mad, and the farm man danced with them, until at last a shrill sound came over the moor. It was the cock from the farmyard, crowing its loudest to welcome the dawn. In an instant, the revelry ceased, and the fairies, with cries of alarm, 
crowded together and rushed towards the crag, dragging the countryman along in their midst. As they reached the rock, a mysterious door, which he never remembered having seen before, opened in it of its own accord, and shut again with a crash as soon as the fairy host had trooped through. The door led into a large, dimly lighted hall, full of tiny couches, and here the little folk sank to rest, tired out with their exertions, while the good man sat down on a piece of rock in the corner, wondering what would happen next. But there seemed to be some kind of spell thrown over his senses, for even when the fairies awoke and began to go about their household occupations and to carry out certain curious practices which he had never seen before and which, as you will hear, he was forbidden to speak of afterwards, he was content to sit and watch them without in any way attempting to escape. As it drew toward evening, someone touched his elbow, and he turned round with a start to see the little woman with the green dress and scarlet stockings, who had remonstrated with him for lifting the turf the year before, standing by his side. The divots which thou tookest from the roof of my house have grown once more, she said, and once more it is covered with grass, so thou canst go home again, for justice is satisfied, thy punishment have lasted long enough, but first thou take thy solemn oath never to tell to mortal ears what thou hast seen whilst thou hast dwelt among us. The countryman promised gladly, and he took his solemn oath. When the door was opened, he was at liberty to depart. His can of milk was standing on the green, just where he had laid it down when he went to sleep, and it seemed to him as if it were only yesternight that the farmer had given it to him. But when he reached home, he was speedily undeceived, for his wife looked at him as if he were a ghost, and the children whom he had left we, toddling things were now well-grown boys and girls, who stared at him as if he had been an utter stranger. Where hast thou been these long, long years? cried his wife, when she had gathered her wits, and had seen that it was really he, and not a spirit. And how couldst thou find it in thy heart to leave the wee barns and me alone? And when he knew that the day he had passed in fairyland had lasted seven whole years, and he realised how heavy the punishment had been which the wee folk had laid upon him. The Mermaid Wife A story is told of an inhabitant of Unst in the northern Shetland Isle, who, in walking on the sandy margin of a vow, saw a number of mermen and mermaids dancing by moonlight, and several seal skins strewed beside them on the ground. At his approach, they immediately fled to secure their garbs, and taking upon themselves the form of seals, 
plunged immediately into the sea. But as the Shetlander perceived that one skin lay close to his feet, he snatched it up, bore it swiftly away, and placed it in concealment. On returning to the shore, he met the fairest damsel that ever gazed upon the mortal's eyes. Lamenting the robbery by which she had become an exile from her submarine friends and a tenant of the upper world. Vainly, she implored the restitution of her property. The man had drunk deeply of love and denied her, but he offered her protection beneath his roof as his betrothed spouse. The merlady, perceiving that she must become an inhabitant of the earth, found that she could not do better than accept of the offer. This strange attachment subsisted for many years, and the couple had several children. The Shetlander's love for his mere wife was unbounded, but his affection was coldly returned. The lady would often steal alone to the desert strand, and on a signal being given, a large seal would make his appearance, with whom she would hold in an unknown tongue an anxious conference. Years had thus glided away, when it happened that one of the children, in the course of his play, found concealed beneath a stack of corn a seal skin, and delighted with the prize. He ran with it to his mother. Her eyes glistened with rapture. She gazed upon it as her own as the means by which she could pass through the ocean that led to her native home. She burst forth into an ecstasy of joy, which was only moderated when she beheld her children, whom she was now about to leave, and after hastily embracing them, she fled with all speed, towards the seaside. The husband immediately returned, learned the discovery that had taken place, ran to overtake his wife, but only arrived in time to see her transformation of shape completed. To see her in the form of a seal, bound from the ledge of a rock into the sea, the large animal of the same kind with whom she had held a secret converse soon appeared, and evidently congratulated her in the most tender manner on her escape. But before she dived to unknown depths, she cast a parting glance at the wretched Shetlander, whose despairing looks excited in her breast a few transient feelings of commiseration. Farewell, she said to him, and may all good attend you. I loved you very well when I resided upon earth, but I always loved my first husband much better. <laughs>